Egg, we just asked if we were starting the stream, so the answer is yes, we're working on it. Okay, stream, stream's up? Yep, okay, hold on. Okay, oh, that's not having any issues with the stream. Uh, okay, great. So um, if I haven't met you guys already, my name's Ben. Uh, it was a nice small class today, so talk, ask questions, whatever. Um, those of you that brave the snow, you know, take, take as much time asking questions as you need. Uh, today we're going to talk about generative adversarial networks, which are kind of a super hot topic, especially um, they came out at the end of 2014. 2015, 2016, even 2017 were like completely full of GAN papers, still really popular now. Uh, all the details are not completely worked out, so it's very much like an open area of study. And um, so we're going to actually have two talks about it. Uh, for right now, we're going to talk about kind of like the good sides of GANs, basically like what are they, what do they do, how cool are they, what are all the neat little problems and tricks and stuff that we can do with them. And then next week, we're going to get more into like the training issues that you have with GANs and, and all the, the kind of complexities of getting them to actually work correctly. Um, we'll see that's kind of the main difference between GANs and, well, there are many differences between GANs and VAEs, but one of the one of the important things to keep in mind is that GANs are much harder to train and get working and getting to do what you, what you want them to do than traditional networks. And there are several reasons which we'll, we'll get to as we go through the presentation. So um, to start off, we're just going to talk a little bit about generative networks themselves. So this is some of what uh, Tom talked about last week. But the important thing is to understand what is a generative network and what is a discriminative network. So, Discriminative networks are the types of things you've been building so far. It's P of Y given X. It's what is the type of the image given the image. Is this a cat, is this a dog, whatever. Generative networks are, roughly speaking, everything else. So there, there are a lot of things that are called generative networks. But if you're trying to model what images uh, are in the MNIST data set, can you generate digits? Or can you gener generate digits based on the number? So you build a network where if I say generate me a five, it can draw me different types of fives. Um, and also there are, are joint models where instead of modeling P of Y given X, you're actually modeling joint distribution, P of X and Y, kind of lumping them together both as, as inputs to your model. So why, would you, why are these generative networks interesting and what kind of makes them different? Because um, why would you choose to model something like a joint distribution instead of just modeling you know, here's my label, because the label's what you're normally interested in. So you can still use these generative networks to make judgments about things like the P of Y given X, which is kind of your intended goal, but then you get all these extra features, you get more insight into the model. So you can also generate your data given your, given your labels, which gives you some insight into what the model thinks is important, what the model's doing. Um, but what this means is that it's much harder to learn. Because if you think about learning your labels based on images, you've got all this image input data, and you're just trying to give it one label. You have a very simple network. It's got 10 outputs that gives you labels. Um, each image has a label, roughly speaking. So it is a distribution, but like we just have one hot encoded representation of what it's supposed to be. It's pretty straightforward to learn versus having something that is this big stochastic model where you give it the input digit, and it gives you all the images that might have that, that uh, digit. So the model from X to Y is uh, many different images mapping to one or two labels, relatively easy to build, versus a function that goes from Y to X is a single label and the millions of possible images that someone could make that are you know, the number five or something. So it's a much harder problem, and also keep in mind the dimensionality of Y is way less than dimensionality of, sorry, that's dimensionality of Y is, should be less than X. So like in your typical situation, like MNIST, you've got 784 input variables, and you've got like a 10 dimensional label. So one, one side of the equation is much more complicated than the other. Um, so these are all the things that can kind of uh, be interesting about them, but make them a little bit harder. Um, just in general, this is not about GANs yet. This is generative models. Um, but what's interesting about them is that you start having different biases when you work in a kind of generative mindset. That if what your model is trying to do is just trying to learn how to generate this joint distribution, is trying to learn how everything's related to each other, 
it's actually going to build somewhat of a, a deeper or more interesting understanding than just the, the, the straightforward predict my labels, give my images. So there's some interesting results by Ng and Jordan, who are both heavyweights in machine learning, if you kind of follow the research. Um, but what's interesting, what they're finding is that, yes, if you're given an infinite amount of data of input images and their labels, then the best model is going to be one that just takes in images and gives you labels. But when you start having less data, you actually have a better bias, and uh, you're more efficient with your parameters when you're doing something that's a generative model. So this, again, is not talking about GANs yet, but it's some of the motivation for why they're doing it. So, so in their case, it's an naive Bayes, and they're comparing it to a logistic regression for the same type of problem. And they're finding that as they change the number of, uh, the number of inputs that they're giving the model, that the, uh, dis the generative network is more efficient. So really, the key line there is the generative model may, may approach its error faster than the discriminative model possibly with a number of training samples that is only logarithmic rather than linear. So it's basically saying that the number of samples you need to train a given thing, it's much more efficient to use this, this kind of generative network, even if given an infinite amount of data, you might not get you know, your, your perfect ideal results. Does that, mean, does that mean using a generative model as a classifier? Or yes. Okay. Yeah, it's using it as part of your classifier. Um, so I would definitely say read through the paper for their specific results. It doesn't, um, it's not actually like a deep learning thing necessarily, but it's the broader sense of, like, like I said, it's, it's very simple models you're using, like just logistic regression versus just a naive Bayes, but it, it kind of gets a sense of what, what biases are built in. Um, so it's important to compare GANs to VAEs. So we're gonna do a, a short recap on VAEs and so I guess, I guess before I do that, any questions on like what generative models are, how they're different than discriminative models, things along those lines? Okay. Um, uh, a VAE is a generative model, yeah. but an autoencoder is not. So one of the reasons we compare them is VAEs are kind of like the, they were the most important generative model until GANs came about, yeah. basically. So I, w I don't want to say GAN supplant VAEs, but in a lot of ways they do address the same issues, and it's the more recent kind of. It, it's been hot recently, whether it you know whether it pans out or whether it's like a wave, we'll we'll see. Um, a regular autoencoder is not a generative model because you can't directly generate. So you have an autoencoder; it takes inputs, it makes them embedded, and then it takes the and that's that's the encoding part, and then it takes the embedded stuff and it generates it and that's the decoder part. The problem is you don't have a way to generate data of your embedded, of, of your latent dimension. You don't know what your latent dimension is gonna be if it's just a general autoencoder. The autoencoder could choose to encode things however it feels like it wants to encode things, which means that that autoencoder is going to encode things efficiently, but you don't know what that encoding is gonna be. So you can put something into the autoencoder and get an image out, but there's no way for you to put noise into the autoencoder and just directly generate images. Because that, that prior, like, the, the autoencoder is training P of X given Z, which is a conditional distribution. What you don't have is you don't have P of Z. If you had P of Z and P of X given Z, then you could have a generative model where you're generating the X. But because you don't, in a regular autoencoder, you don't have any sense of what that encoding is going to be. You can't do that. Versus what a VAE really is, is it's making that hidden dimension. Like, I want that hidden dimension to be the Gaussian normal distribution. And as soon as you say that, and as soon as that's true, then I can just generate samples from the Gaussian, and I can run it into my network, and I can generate stuff. So it's, that's, that's the key about VAEs. So, um, and I guess that's point number th three and four there. But anyway, so VAEs, you do have an autoencoder part, which is, and you know, in both what we call them and kind of mathematically what we say, the encoder is the P of Z given X, and the decoder is the P of X given Z. It's kind of the most common to use Z for your encoding, but it's not, it's not entirely consistent across papers, but that is probably the most common thing. And when you do a variational autoencoder, it is learning Z. It is free to 
make z whatever it wants z to be, but it's regularization that is causing it to try and match the prior. So there's no guarantee when you're running a variational autoencoder that the encoding that it's going to learn is actually a Gaussian. You have a regularization loss that's saying, please be as close to a Gaussian as you want it to be. You're asking your model nicely to make a Gaussian, but that doesn't actually mean that the encodings that it's going to generate are actually Gaussians. They're going to be a little bit off. Um, that will become important and relevant later. But really, what you should think about is that it's going to learn its own z, but you're telling it to make that z match some prior that is a Gaussian or something that you analytically determine, like a very well understood distribution. And then because we do that, and this is like the key point here, since we know what z is, we know what our prior is. Our prior is a Gaussian. We can generate samples from a Gaussian easily. Just you know, Google it, use numpy, whatever. That means that now we can generate samples from the latent space. Um, and just kind of looking at the bottom to understand some of the ways that people write it, it's just important. Um, there are a lot of different ways to view VAEs, as, as Tom talked about last time. Like There are 10 different ways to explain why they work. But kind of from, th from this viewpoint, the way to look at it is you've got log of p of x given z, which is just your reconstruction error. It is how well is your decoder doing. And then it's got this extra term that is saying, my encoding should be whatever my prior is. And typically, we do a Gaussian or something along those lines. So um, I guess any questions you guys are unclear on just the basics of VAEs? Yeah. So that is the loss of the VAE? Uh, yeah, yeah. That would be your, actually, that's not the loss. That's the, um, the thing you're trying to maximize because it goes the other way. Um, so so for, for, for the full equation, uh, go to Tom's notes. That's actually, because um, you want to maximize the neck. Your loss is the negative log of p of x given z plus the KL, I think. So I, I, would, I would double check with, um, the, the, the full equations are in the other slides, but uh, they, they do break down like that. Why would the posterior of the um, autoencoder in the latent space be not normal? Um, well, you're just giving it regularization that's saying, please try to be normal. But the, the network is learning what it wants to learn. So it's actually balancing out the two things. It's, if you didn't have that term on the left, then it would be the normal distribution. But because it has that term on the left, then it has to balance between the two of them. And if you had only the term on the left, it would do an amazing job of encoding things, but because they have the term on the right, it actually does a worse job of encoding things. So basically what you'll see is if you built a autoencoder and a VAE for the same problem, encoding and decoding things would look better on the autoencoder not the variational autoencoder. Because you can kind of think of like, because there are two terms, you can think of like each term as competing for, for how, much the, how hard the model is working on it. There's also another explanation, which is the whole problem of how when you're running a VAE, you take the expectation out of the log. So um, I don't think we've really talked a whole lot about that, but. <clears throat> yeah, it's that what you want to maximize is the log of the expected probability. But in a VAE, we're maximizing the expected log probability. And then there's this whole discussion about convexity and why it's a lower bound. But like, we're not really doing everything perfect in a VAE anyway. So there, there are other reasons why. But if the full consideration comes only from imposing a normal assumption, you want it to be as normal as possible, and that's why it might not fit data very well. Yeah, but, well, because you're saying to, make, to try to make something normal and maybe the, the true distribution isn't normal or whatever it is, but it's, it's trying to balance between that and doing the reconstruction. So practically speaking, we'll see some, some examples later of VAEs versus GANs. And GANs, uh, one of the things that they do is they solve this problem entirely, which is your Z is exactly your prior. It is kind of locked into that, and we'll, we'll see why. But um, that kind of gets to why we're comparing them with VAEs. So the thing with VAEs is you're learning the Z, you're hoping it'll be matching your prior, but it's not always there. It kind of depends on how you train it and a lot of other you know, training details. Um, so with that, um, and we'll, we'll bring up VAEs some more as we talk more about GANs and kind of the comparisons between them. And there, there's a whole slide about uh, you know, the differences and the comparisons so we can Get to those in a little bit. 
But anyway, so now that we get to generative adversarial networks, this is the hot topic. This is, um, this is what we're all here for today. Um, they're relatively new, flurry of activity, tons of publications, search on archive, you'll kind of see how crazy it is. Um, but they are a new way to build these generative models, which previously we mainly relied on VAEs for. Um, things like Boltzmann machines are also kind of useful as generative models, but they're, they're kind of a pain to train. So like, people have really had a lot of issues of how to build generative models. Like, we're all pretty clear on how to build discriminative models. You make a CNN, you give it the outputs, you, you know, cross entropy loss. It's pretty straightforward. But generative models are kind of a whole new beast that has been uh, making a big deal in recent years. So one of the differences between GANs and VAEs and why they've made a bunch of splash is that they have a lot more flexibility and potential. They produce sharper results. They produce cleaner results. The outputs that you're getting are way better. However, the problem is that they're much harder to train. It's much easier to make a VAE in a couple lines of Python than to actually get a GAN. And once you actually write the GAN, it's much more sensitive to how you train it and all the parameters versus VAEs just kind of work. So there are kind of two parts to a, uh, to a GAN. Uh, the first part is your generator. This is basically kind of what your decoder was. It takes the hidden space, which we're calling Z, and it gives you the image or whatever it is you're trying to do called X. Um, so you take a sample from the hidden space and you put it into it. So in terms of what it's actually doing, it's the same exact thing as a decoder in an autoencoder is doing. The difference is how you're training it. So that first point here is really important, which is the inputs to the model, you are sampling from your prior distribution. And you're just taking those samples and putting them as inputs. So your inputs aren't being generated using another encoder model and using the data. So in a VAE, your inputs to the decoder are the outputs of your encoder, which makes sense. It's an encoder decoder. They're linked together. In a generator, you don't in the generator that's being created for GANs, you actually don't have that encoder part. You are starting directly at the decoder part, and the decoder is being fed directly with the data from the prior. Um, and the other difference is on the outputs. You're not giving it true data and saying, reconstruct this true data. So a VAE at the end of the decoder, what are you training with? Typically something like the L2 difference between its outputs and the images, something along those lines. You're trying to make the, out, the, the output match a specific image, and you're calculating a loss or a distance between the two of them. With a generator, you don't have that as your loss function. Your loss function is a neural network. So it's not I'm using cross entropy loss or L2 loss. It's actually a neural network that's telling you which way to go and how to update things. Um, so we have a several slides on that and kind of the implications, which we'll get to in a second. Um, but also keep in mind, as this generator is training, the discriminator is frozen. You're treating your discriminator as just a black box loss, loss function while you're training your generator. So to your generator, your discriminator is just this back black box that tells it what to do. <clears throat> the other portion is the discriminator. Uh, what the discriminator does is it tries to tell what the difference is between true images and your generated images. So the, uh, the real data goes directly to the discriminator as well as the outputs of your decoder. And what your discriminator is trying to do is it's trying to tell what's the difference between the two of them. And that way, the generator wants to fool the discriminator. So there are a lot of ways people have phrased it, like counterfeiting or trying to fool or something along those lines. But it basically means the discriminator wants to tell the difference. The generator wants there to be no difference. And if there's no difference, then that means your generator is generating the images or whatever it is that you want it to be generating. Um, so in the original uh, GAN paper, this has changed many times, but it's standard cross entropy loss that people are using. So your discriminator is outputting a label, and it's trained with cross entropy to say, I want to give a 1 to things that are real, and I want to give a 0 to things that are false. Versus the, uh, the generator is basically trying to do the opposite. So while you're training the discriminator, you kind of treat the generator as this frozen thing that outputs data. 
and the discriminator is the black box for the generators we said before. So they're, they're alternately kind of frozen with respect to each other when the other one is training, and they update each other, but they don't really have internal information about each other. They just, um, oh, sorry, so one slide too many. Uh, so the discriminator and the loss functions. Okay. So in terms of the actual loss functions and the implementation, um, there are a lot of different ways that they've been written, but here's one example. So your generator wants the discriminator to label it as real. So the generator's loss is the negative log likelihood of the discriminator's outputs of the generator's outputs of Z. So that explains D, G, Z. It's the outputs that, the, it's what does the discriminator say about what my generator produced? Versus the discriminator, it has two things it's trying to do. It's trying to maximize the negative log likelihood of the discriminator of the real value, so that's d of x, and it's trying to do the other thing, the other label, for the, uh, for the values that are output by the generator. So basically, the discriminator and the generator want to do opposite things for the, the generated data. And it's this competition between them that makes the adversarial network actually work. Um, so the generator wants the discriminator to output a one, and the discriminator's job is to say zero for generated data, but one for real data. That's the task both of them have. They're trying to do both tasks at the same time. And what that means is that we actually can describe it by a min-max game. This is kind of a compacted version of what we have before. But it's basically saying there's kind of one loss that one guy's trying to make as high as possible, one guy's trying to make as low as possible, and when they kind of fight it out and reach some sort of equilibrium, we're at a good place where we're going to have the images that we want. And that's described, um, actually, that's, that's in a couple slides. But just to uh, kind of recap, here's the, the very simplified path of noise goes into your generator and that produces a fake image. Your discriminator is looking at your fake images and your training set and trying to decide if it's real or false, or real or fake. So that's the, uh, the kind of simplest view of what it's doing. Shouldn't be too hard to understand. Um, and then here is the, what I'm calling like the math conceptual diagram, which has got a little more labels on it. Um, but this is kind of showing, uh, just in terms of notation, what we call all of those things. But it, it basically aligns with what we had before. But um, that's the type of, it's one choice of syntax that we use, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of variety in the papers, so it's not going to be consistent. Um, but anyways, that, that's a basic sense of how it works. And then here's what I call the, uh, the fun conceptual diagram. But this is the way people have kind of described it, of like a forger. And what's kind of interesting about it is you see the forger has like a blindfold on. So that's trying to show that like he doesn't really know what he's supposed to be painting or what he's supposed to be doing. All he does is the detective tells him no, yes, or like, you know, it's wrong here or wrong there. So he never gets to see the real data, but through the detective, he will eventually try to get something that's near the real data. Um, I've got a blog post linked here. This blog post is called like, again, in 50 lines of PyTorch. So if you're looking for like a quick and easy implementation you guys want to try and what you guys happen to be using, that's worth reading. Um, so one of the things about training that's kind of tricky is that you have to understand that there are simultaneous updates, and that's why I have a, a separate slide just mentioning this, which is that um, both the generator and the discriminator are working with moving targets and moving distributions. You can't just train one and then train the other. You have to actually do some interleaving or simultaneous updates, um, and the reason is because the discriminator needs to constantly change what it's doing based on how well the generator is doing, and the generator needs to do what it, the generator needs to change based on the discriminator. So they, they do uh, kind of work hand in hand even though they're adversarial, but yeah. Why does the discriminator need to change what it does based on the discriminator? Um, there are a lot of reasons. One good reason is let's say, if there are two different points that you're generating, then you wanna have, if there's a point which only the generator is producing, then you wanna give it a zero. If there's a point that only, the, that only the real data has, then you want to give it a one. If there's a point which both the generator and the discriminator, I'm oh, sorry, 
there's a point that both the generated data and the real data are both producing, then you actually want to give that a 0.5. Just because that's the minima of the, the, actual, the actual thing. So the discriminator's trying to say, is this more likely a generated point or more likely real data? And the ratio of whether any given point is real or fake changes as soon as your fake data changes. So once, once the fake data matches up to your real data, your generator will find a minima of actually outputting a 0.5 for everything as opposed to a zero for these and a one for that. Because if they're not the same point, how could you do, you know, you, you couldn't have both zeros and ones at one point. That would, that's your 0.5, that's where it comes from. Um, Right. And uh, but the generator says zero, right? So if the generator creates something that is matches up with the true, shouldn't it be labeled as one? No, because then if it's labeled as one, then that equation works out to a log of infinity and then you have infinity. So like if if I was like so if you just take it back to like how cross entropy works, uh -huh. if I was training the MNIST data set and I had two examples that were exactly the same image and one was labeled a three and one was labeled a five, then the minima that your network should find is 50% three and 50% five. Just because that's how, that's how cross entropy ends up working out. Because um, it's like, if, if you can't be, sh if it had given either 100% three or 100% five, then that network would have infinite loss. Because then you're giving 0% on the case that it is a five, and giving it a zero suddenly makes your loss infinite. Okay. So like it, it, it does have to actually change. And the other reason is like the parts of the space change. Um, I don't know if we have a great, uh, I, actually you know what, we'll, we'll get to that as we, I have a video that kind of explains a little bit of that, of why they change. Um, now there is a stationary point, which is the point where neither of them change, they're both equilibrium. Uh, when that happens, this is what we were talking about, which is if the generated data and the real data are exactly the same, then you're, I'm sorry, that should be discriminator. But your discriminator should output 0.5 for everybody, which means for every point on the map, it's not more likely to be one or the other. It's equally likely to be real and fake. And that's a good way to look at it, is your, your ideal situation is where every point, the ratio of real to generated is you know, the same. Um, so when you get to a point where the discriminator is outputting a constant value, that stops the generator because the generator doesn't have any gradient to go on. The gradient it's working on is completely constant, so that stops the generator. So that's the reason why when the generator is good, the discriminator should start outputting something flat, and when the discriminator starts outputting something flat, the generator should stop updating. Now, in no way does this prove convergence. They actually, in practice, sometimes converge, sometimes don't. What it means is there is a point that it can converge to which is a much looser statement, but this will kind of be a trend as we talk through GANs, that they do have much less of a kind of theoretical basis than things like VAEs, but they are much more kind of engineering based, I would say. Um, so conceptually, here's kind of a, this is the picture from the original paper. It's, um, it's obviously uh, you know, manufacturedly drawn, so it's probably not a real training example. But what we have here are we have the blue, which is the discriminator, we have the green, which is your real data, and then we have the dots, which is the data you're trying to match. So what it's trying to show is as you're training, the discriminator tells your green line which way to go, and then once your green line matches up to the black line, then your discriminator should become flat. So that's why in the last slide, the discriminator is now a, a flat variable. So that, sh that shows how the discriminator kind of changes. Um, which hopefully goes a little ways to answering your question about why they have to change. Um, but, yeah, of course. So, okay, so the first one, it's all the discriminator. I think it's just untrained discriminator oh, sure. or something along those lines. So then it, it has like two dropping points, right? So it has, or like, yeah. like right around where the green and blue cross, I guess, dropping pretty hard. Right. right. Okay, so now what is that inform? how is that informing the generator. So for each, each point on the generator, 
each point of the generated line, it's trying to go up the blue line. So it's basically all of this data is trying to go in that direction of the gradient. So how do you so do that? I, I'm having trouble seeing that visually. Um, yeah, actually, it's not. Uh, let, let me see if this answers a little bit. So this is, that, that was kind of like a line. But this is a, a very simple example I made, which is, oh, that did not. That is a link. What? Yeah, do I have to just a clicker down, maybe? I don't know where your page down is on this guy. So scroll down. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and if these don't work, it's not a huge deal. I could always like manually make them on the board, honestly. But the videos are kind of nice. Um, Oh, that, that works, that's fine. Yeah, okay, so now this is gonna take a little explanation. Um, so this is the simplest, most bare bones scan that is physically possible. We, our data is just a two dimensional point. We have only one real data point and we have one generated data point. So the real data point is the green, the generated data point is the blue, and the gradient is what the discriminator is doing. So basically, and the discriminator in this case is just a one layer MLP. So, so this is as bare bones as it can get and still be a GAN. So what you're gonna see is this is just one point so you can visualize what it's doing. The gradient is gonna tell the blue point which way to go. But because GANs aren't perfect, you're gonna see a lot of like the blue point will overshoot and then the gradient will work back the other way. So, so it uh, might be a little fast, but you can see how the gradient pushes the blue dot to get towards the green dot. That seems like a lot of overhead to just get one dot to move on top of the other dot, but the key here is the blue dot doesn't know where the green dot is. All it knows is this gradient that's going in the background that's moving things around. And we see when it converges, the value at time scale that's, you know, it's, it's slowly narrowing down to 0.5 versus like things are close, when things are farther apart, large value that's trying to show what the difference is. But the problem with things like GANs is you have these, these uh, oscillations, like it will be getting, it's getting its gradient indirectly, and because it gets it indirectly, it might overshoot and then have to return and have a little bit of wobbling back and forth. So that's a, like the, that's, probably, that's, that's the simplest version of a GAN versus if I was to scroll down to same slide again, it's a little annoying, it's not opening like a new window, but I don't know. Okay, it was, um, Command F. Not that button. Command F. I don't, I don't see it coming. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it was like wherever the YouTubes are. Um, yeah. Okay, weird that it's doing that. Double click to this. No? Okay, so maybe we'll skip that one. Uh, but this one is a, a little more complicated. It's showing an entire distribution and how they move. But you actually get a sense of when you watch a GAN learn as opposed to just like looking at a paper and seeing what a trained GAN looks like, you'll see how all kinds of chaos can happen, how it moves back and forth. Yeah? So can any of this <coughs> It's somewhat, yeah, yeah, it's like, it's kind of that, but it's compounded by the fact that you've got two things working against each other. So even, even aside from those types of issues, which are still present, like GANs have all of your regular optimization issues, but then they have all these other issues. Um, and a lot of those issues aren't directly just because of like the oscillation of any one thing learning. Like your generator can learn everything perfectly and your discriminator learns everything perfectly. The problem is getting them to work in harmony so that one doesn't overpower the other. Um, so like I said, we're gonna t uh, try to show you like the, the shiny side of GANs right now, but then uh, the entire next section is gonna be about what are the issues when we actually try to do it. So um, we wanted to save the, we, we wanted to give you kind of like the motivations for why everyone talks about GANs first. 
and then we'll we'll kind of get to. I don't know why that's not zooming anymore. Let me just get out of it first. Oh yeah, so so we will definitely talk next week. Make sure um, there's a thread on Piazza. If you have any specific questions, make sure to post there. But um, we'll talk more about kind of what what happens when we actually try to do them and what the the practical results are. Um, which today is going to be a okay. Is that one? Yeah. Okay. So today's just going to be kind of like a best hits of what people do with the end. So here's from the original paper, 2014, the very first version, what the generated images from GANs looked like. The thing on the right is real images. The stuff on the left is generated. Uh, the images aren't amazing yet, but this is the first time anyone tried this before, so it's still pretty cool. Um, but that's the type of thing you're trying to do, is you give it a bunch of real images, and then it generates images that are like it in some way. Um, it learns a latent space. That latent space maps to images. So just like in VAEs, you can walk through the latent space and actually see transitions in images. So here's a simple example of walking through different dimensions and what they do. Um, but the key differences between VAEs and GANs, um, VAEs are in general more kind of theoretically, mathematically grounded. GANs are more engineering and kind of what works. VAEs, even if you do a really bad job with hyperparameters, they'll still do something. Versus GANs, if you have something off, they will just kind of go chaotic and different things will happen. Um, one other big difference is that GANs, you traditionally only learn the decoder versus a full encoder-decoder pair in VAEs. And one of the big differences is that the GAN decoder, its inputs are actually the stuff from the prior versus the VAE decoder sees these samples from the model, which might be similar to the prior, but they're not actually guaranteed to be the same as the prior. Um, but here's kind of like the real interesting part where if we want to spend extra time on any slide, I think this is where, this is where it really sells you on, on GANs. Now, well, here's what's interesting about GANs to me. Um, your objective function in most neural networks are things like your L2 function or like you know, EM distance. Like, there's a distance metric that we define and we analytically calculate. When you have a GAN, your objective function is a neural network. So, like, the thing that's telling you how similar two images are isn't I'm going to calculate, you know, this image minus this image squared. It's I'm going to run a neural network which determines how far two things are apart. So, the types of things that you could consider are now just like, Exploded like that. That's the that's that's the free your mind moment. Like loss functions can themselves be networks that are learned from other reasons, and then you can just layer loss function on top of loss function, do all kinds of cool stuff. So it, it's just a new way about thinking about distance. That you're always trying to minimize the distance between generated images and real images, but now the distance isn't just L1, L2, whatever. It's neural network based. So it's, it's not a boring metric. It's some completely new metric, which has just kind of come about. So what that means is that the things that we do in neural networks now carry over to your loss functions. So one pretty simple example is, let's say you have a discriminator that uses max pooling. And you have a discriminator that's a CNN. And your discriminator has certain biases built into it that relate to how we think perception works. Now your loss function has those same things. So if you have a network which is shift invariant, you can have a loss function which is shift invariant. Versus something like L2 loss, if you calculate the difference between an image and the image slightly shifted, you get you know, extraordinarily high numbers. Um, so it's just a different way of doing it. And the, so for example, CNNs, it looks at local features. It can look at different shapes and sharp edges. So those are the things that matter, not just some L2 base, basis. The problem with L2 is L2 tends to make things that are blurry. Because L2 is basically, it, it's the definition of the mean. Like, the mean of something minimizes the L2 distance with all other things. So when you're doing a VAE, and it's trained with L2, because your, your decoder output is using L2 to, to match your, uh, your results, you tend to get things that are blurry it basically is getting the, the average image. Versus with the GAN, because your loss is using CNNs, it's using these things that are really good at determining features and small details, but might be 
um, invariant to slight shifts, then you have a completely different set of things that you're looking at. And um, basically, there's this point at the bottom, which is like <clears throat> a neural network is like the definition of perceptual. Like if you talk about something being perceptually similar, you're saying that my brain, when it processes it, puts these two things in the same spot. And if you think your brain works like a CNN, then it's like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Because it's like, if you want things to be perceptually similar, you shouldn't be using L1 or L2. You should be using a neural network, which is arguably perception. So that's kind of uh, the, the, the mind expansion of what makes GANs so unique and why they, they have this, this huge potential. Um, Could yeah. you use a neural network in a variational autonomous network instead of uh, regular human The problem is that you have to train that network to do something and that network has to be trained to, if, if you try to do, th there are combinations of GANs and VAEs, but roughly speaking, as soon as you start training that other network, it's gonna start looking like some sort of GAN. So we talked about the plain GAN, but we're gonna talk about a lot of different ways people have sliced up GANs and, and put them together. Um, so one kind of simple example, we don't need to spend too much time like drawing this out, but um, generating random white noise if you tried to have a VAE that auto-encoded white noise, it would be like a very, very, very hard task for that VAE to do because it's trying to maximize the, the reconstruction, right? If you want to reconstruct white noise, you have to know what literally every single bit is. And if, you, if there's something you don't know, then you can't reconstruct it and you do terribly. So it's a very hard thing for VAE to do. And if you don't have enough data to actually tell what you're supposed to do, like if I don't know that if something's supposed to be one or zero, then I'm gonna output 0.5. So if you threw a bunch of white noise into a VAE, you would get a basically gray, or largely gray. Versus if you have something that is a GAN, it's actually amazing. It, it's, your GAN can be trained to generate white noise and it will have zeros and ones, it won't be outputting 0.5s. And the reason is, if you have one output that is all 0.5 everywhere and another output that is random white noise of ones and zeros, you can have a CNN that tells the difference between those pretty easily. So it's these types of things that are, are why people at a very high level just refer to it as like one's blurrier and one's sharper, but this is kind of a, one of the explanations of why you see the difference. Now it seems arbitrary to see random white noise, but where you really see this come up in practice is things like textures. So if you wanted to have a VAE that generated carpet, and I look at this carpet right now, it would generate like a gray blob, roughly speaking. Versus a GAN can actually recognize the features and try to build something that looks like carpet. Does this white noise mean either white noise to the original? Oh no, I was talking about if your input is literally like static from a TV screen. So like if you have, if you have input that has no logical pattern whatsoever, oh then a VAE will actually try to go for the average because that's the best it can do. Yeah. Versus if you, that, that's kind of the thing. If a VAE doesn't know what to do, it will go for the average versus if a GAN doesn't know what to do, it will go for whatever kind of fits the features better and that tends to be a better result. Is this white noise uh, uh, Gaussian? I mean, this was just an example. I mean, any noise. Oh. I mean, if, if there's anything where you don't have, where, if there's anything that's noise, your VAE has to encode the noise. Because your VAE is trying to reconstruct the input. Yeah. So if your input has a bunch of noise in it, your VAE has to encode that noise and then use all of that noise to produce something good. Versus the GAN doesn't actually have to do that. The yeah. GAN just needs to make something that's perceptually similar to whatever the input was. Uh, I think uh, if we uh, assume the uh, noise is Gaussian and we can use VAE to then the Gaussian Right, but then that would just be, you would just have a wide Gaussian that covered zeros and ones. So like that, that isn't learning anything. The point being that VAE would have a very high loss versus the VAE that gave you 0.5 would have a better loss. It would just be giving you random. Um, Is it fair to say that the VAEs will Yeah, like v VAEs will tend to very easily get like large shapes and stuff in the data because that's what the L2 is kind of about of like, if I take this image, like I can get the, the accurate L, I can encode the entire L2 of this whole space. It's just like a bunch of gray and get a pretty reasonable L2 versus getting the actual like 
this is brighter, this is darker, and like all like the, the small details, and coding that is very difficult. So you'll you'll really see the difference in things like textures and any like noisy types of things when you actually run the uh, the results. Um, so that I guess brings us to we're at we're at nine fifty, so we've got plenty of time actually. Um, <coughs> So that's, that's the core GAN model, what GANs are, what they do, and why they're cool. So we're going to talk about kind of all the different models that people have taken these GANs and expand them to other things with. So any questions about the, the core GAN and kind of like what it is before we go on? All right. So what can we actually do with GANs? Um, there, uh, there's definitely a flurry. This is just some of the... Uh, the more interesting ways people have taken it over the last couple of years. So we're going to go through these. Um, I think we've got enough time to spend a little bit of time on each of them. Um, they're somewhat chronological, not entirely. Um, anyways, so one of, one of the simplest uh, expansions to GANs is what's called a conditional GAN. So instead of just learning P of X, you learn P of X given Y. Seems straightforward, um, kind of obvious why you would want to do this. So for example, you don't just want to make something that generates MNIST images, you want it to generate MNIST images based on which digit I want to generate. So you give it the digit you want to generate and it gives you images as opposed to the plain GAN, which would just be giving you the marginal, here are what images look like. Um, so your generator in this case, it learns P of X given Z and Y which was not there previously, and your discriminator is learning a probability of whether it's true or false given x and y. So it's basically the same thing as your GAN, but there's a comma and y added to both of your, both your models, and obviously that's a new input. So instead of just giving it the MNIST images, you give it MNIST images and labels. Um, the min-max looks about the same. The only difference is you see the, the conditional got added, so that shouldn't be anything you know, too too hard to get your grip around, but it's just that you're adding these in. Here's kind of a graphical uh, explanation of what you're doing. Um, so you just see that they've added these Ys, and the discriminator looks at the Y, and the generator looks at the Y. And both discriminator and generator are neural networks, et cetera, et cetera. Question? What's the X in the discriminator? The X in the discriminator would either be, uh, that X would be the, uh, Sorry, the uh, the real input. So that line's the real input. That line's the fake input, and that line's the the y's. Yeah. So it's either the y that was for the real one, or the y that was for the fake one, depending on which part of the training we're talking about. Um, so this is if you want to generate a conditional distribution. Uh, here's one example of how they did it. So um, as opposed to the uh, sorry. As opposed to the MNIST that uh, the original GAN paper did, which just generated all of the digits, now they can generate specific digits if they want to generate the digit. But when they try to generate a specific digit, they can actually generate all different types of threes and all different types of fours, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the thing to keep in mind is it's a single neural network that is producing all of these images. You just tell it which image to produce, and here's the stuff that it comes out with. Not the cleanest results in the world, but one of the earlier papers. <clears throat> so now we see how people have kind of used GANs to clean up images. And here's an interesting idea, which is called Laplacian Pyramid GANs, or LAP GANs. Um, I don't know if anyone knows about pyramids from image processing, but we will have a slide on that in a second. But basically, what conditional GANs are doing, uh, LAP GAN uses conditional GANs. And what it does is it progressively generates less blurry images. So it's a cat GAN, meaning it's conditioned on one thing to generate another thing. So what it does is, from a blurry image, generate a slightly sharper image. And then have another GAN that's conditioned on that slightly sharper image to make an even sharper image. And the way it's doing that is it's going down through the levels of blur in a Laplacian pyramid. So a single GAN kind of slightly increases the sharpness of one of one layer, and then you stack a bunch of these CGANs together, and you can generate really large images and really sharp images because you've broken them out into different portions. And what that actually looks like is here's where the namesake is, a Laplacian pyramid. Uh, 
you basically blur and you subsample and you end up with these varying degrees of, of blur of your image. So instead of trying to teach a model to generate some you know, 300 pixel image, you train a model to generate a 4x4 four four image and then another model to generate an 8x8 eight eight image based on the 4x4. Four four. You do that you know, however many times, you'd have to look at the paper to see how many times they do it, but you're able to basically do this upsampling using conditional GANs and generate things that are relatively sharp. So um, conceptually speaking, here's kind of what they have. Um, what we just said is a little bit of, a, uh, of an oversimplification because they're not working on the blurred images. They're actually working on the, uh, the difference of the Gaussians, which is the Laplacian. So that basically means they're drawing what are the additional details at a given level of zoom. So it's like they're, they're drawing additional lines on the image at lower and lower levels. So this is kind of a you know, from top to bottom, drawing a parrot and how it kind of gets sharper and sharper as you go through multiple GANs. And each one of these slices is itself a GAN. So you see there's a discriminator one, a discriminator two, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a GAN one, there's a GAN two. So it's just taking this model and kind of replicating it, training them all together. And you can, so the moral of this story really is that you can take multiple GANs in combination and you can generate things in series, you can break up your data into multiple zoom levels, things along those lines, and you can really take that single GAN component and use it however you want as part of another model. So the intermediate um, discriminator outputs that right. you used here, like it's, it shows it's outputting like real or generated, but like. Yeah, they're outputting real and generated, and then those go into a loss function as to whether they were real or generated. They're just not drawing the loss part, if that's what you're asking. Okay. But yeah, so what each of the these. Yeah, so, okay. so that's the thing to keep in mind about uh, uh, GANs is you're training two things in a GAN, which is a generator and a discriminator. Your discriminator, when you're done training, is a function that outputs 0.5 for everything you give it. That's completely useless. So your generator, your generator is useful. That's the thing you're trying to train. Your discriminator basically makes itself useless if it does its job. So the discriminator is like a throwaway thing in, in pretty much all cases. Um, versus when you're doing a VAE, you train an encoder, you train a decoder, both of them are something that you could you know, use because that's what they do. Um, so in terms of what it actually does, here's some images and you can see it actually generating um, from the right to the left. In, so section A is just random samples from the data for kind of what the stuff it makes looks like. And then B is from right to left at making something more sharp. So it generates a cow or something like that, but it generates it by making a blurry cow and then slightly better cows. So um, this is one of the, the first steps towards making much sharper generative models than we were able to do with, uh, with VAEs. Um, so the next, the next kind of big step was uh, DC GAN, um, which is deep convolutional GANs. Um, it came after LAPGAN and was kind of in, a little bit inspired by it, but it uses a lot of um, extra techniques. So this paper really um, kind of showed how much you have to do to get a GAN to work correctly. But um, it was very hard to get GANs to work on the type of deep convolutional network architectures that we use for discriminative networks. So GANs are great in theory, but like I can train 150 layer ResNet no problem on discriminative tasks. Training that with a GAN is like close to impossible. Um, but some of the techniques they use to try to make it work better are things like leaky relose, using batch norm, using strata convolutions. They were very much inspired by all CNN, which you guys should be very familiar with by now. But um, so DC GAN came after all CNN, was inspired by it, and found that the types of architectures that we saw in all CNN are actually much better for generators and discriminators than traditional max pooling and yada yada. So these are some of the standards that were set for, and you'll notice we're talking a lot about images and that's because like 99% of GAN work has been on images. This is all applicable to speech. If you guys you know, love speech processing and text processing stuff, there are definitely variants for all of that. But the, the large thrust has been definitely images. Um, so in terms of DCGAN, the architecture, 
they were able to train several convolutional layers. I know it doesn't look that deep, but um, this was pretty deep for a GAN at the time when most GANs are like two or three layers. Um, they were able to get all the way up to like five or six or something. Um, so they talked a little bit about how they did that. And now we're on to a point where, where they can generate relatively large resolution images. These are, um, it's the LSUN database, which is basically pictures of people's bedrooms. Not as salacious as it sounds. Um, but you can see all the different varieties of images. And these images are not um, in the source data. So it's generating new bedrooms based on having seen a lot of old bedrooms. And you'll see that the, the edges are kind of relatively sharp. Some of the edges will be kind of curvier than you would want them to be. But it doesn't have as much, uh, it doesn't have that kind of like blurry effect when the, the lines and the transitions between things tend to be very sharp. Um, we can also do vector math. We saw a little bit of this with VAEs, but it's nice to just mention this is always a, a thing people like to do. It makes great examples. Um, vector math, math and word to vec was also a big hit when that came out. But um, vector math with images are things like smiling minus neutral woman plus neutral man is a smiling man. Uh, I guess the, the logic of that makes sense, but it's kind of cool when your algebra of like, lo your logical math of vectors works out to, you know, what, what intuitively should be. Um, we have another example down here we have are things like a man with glasses minus a man without glasses plus a woman with glasses is a woman, I'm sorry, plus a woman without glasses is a woman with glasses. Um, and the comparison right here at the bottom is interesting because if you just did this in pixel space, you would end up with this kind of junky blur. Because you can't just add pixels, like you can't just add the pixels for, for glasses and subtract the pixels for glasses. Like you just get this blurry kind of thing. But in the vector space that it's learned, these, these things are actually meaningful and these are relatively high quality resolution, you know, high resolution images. Um, so that's your, that's your DC GAN and how that works. Um, largely in terms of what it contributed is more practical in terms of things to do to train it, but that's very important to know and we'll talk more about that next time in terms of the, uh, the training and optimization issues. Um, sorry if we're, we're kind of hopping back and forth through a bunch of papers, but there, there was a ton of research in recent years. Um, if you guys have any questions about any one of these specific models, feel free to shout them out, but if you just want to if there's something you want us to like bring up next time or something that you feel like we missed, just post on Piazza and we'll, we'll circle back. But um, so CatGAN is a little different than your, um, than your categorical GAN, uh, sorry, than your uh, conditional GAN, although it has a very similar kind of abbreviation, seems similar. But the difference here is that you're trying to infer labels. So you're not giving it your Ys. You're saying, make up some Ys that seem reasonable. There is a version which is semi-supervised, which is pretty interesting, where you give it some of the Ys, but not all of the Ys, and it tries to figure out what Ys are reasonable and sees how much you can make out of that. Um, so the way this works that makes it different than a regular GAN is that the generator tries to make the discriminator give it a label. It's not trying to make it give it a one or a zero. It's trying to make the, the discriminator gives a distribution over labels. So your discriminator looks much more like it does an MNIST. So instead of going for ones and zeros, it says give me a label, any label. So it tries to fool the discriminator into saying that it is a digit. Versus the discriminator tries to give it a uniform prediction. So what the discriminator wants to do for the generated data is say, I don't know what to call this, I give it nothing. So when it gives it nothing, that would be a high entropy distribution versus when you have this, uh, when you have it actually give it a label, if, if you fool the discriminator into saying I'm 100% sure this is a five, then your entropy goes down to zero and that means your generator has won. Versus the discriminator says I have no idea what this digit is you gave me, it looks like junk, then the, the discriminator is winning. Um, so in terms of what it's conceptually doing, the, the reason the game works is exactly the same as a GAN, but instead of fighting over one value going from zero to one, they're fighting over a distribution going from high entropy to low entropy. Uh, 
So what that actually looks like, you see it here, and this is kind of showing what they're trying to do on the right. So you generate your data, and then your discriminator tells you which category it is. Um, your discriminator is trying to assign categories correctly to your real data, and it's trying to say, nope, I've got, I've got no idea what you are in your, so that's, that's where it says minimize the entropy, maximize the entropy, maximize the entropy. So it's trying to fool it, and um, it's a little more complicated than your typical GAN, but what this means is you're, you're jointly training this, this um, you're, you're training it so that it goes into different categories. Uh, here's how your objective's written out. It's similar to what we had previously in, in some ways, but you see these H's, which of course is shorthand for entropy, and it's trying, one of them's trying to maximize the entropy while the other one's trying to minimize the entropy. So rough, roughly the same structure as before, but um, they're, they're fighting over a different type of value. In terms of what it does, this basically does clustering. So you can do unsupervised clustering by having your model, or having your discriminator try to label things and having your, your uh, generator try to be labeled. So here's one example of a couple different clustering techniques and CatGAN kind of blows them out of the water. Where if you have something like these concentric rings and you group them by L2 distance, then you're gonna group, group points by L2 distance or whatever it is. But all of the traditional ways of clustering things are some bias that we've written, mathematicians have written. You know, we have k-means that is a specific type of clustering that's meant to, sp to optimize some specific thing. Versus here, you're trying to cluster it based on perceptual similarity as, ca as calculated by a network. So you can end up with different types of clustering. Uh, I think the next, oh, I thought I had an extra slide of that. But um, they have some very beautiful examples of like spirals and like interleaved U's is a very common, uh, I don't know if anyone's seen that data set before, but it's like one of the standard clustering data sets. Of you have something that looks like this and something that looks like this, and you tell it to make clusters. And like 99% of clustering algorithms will go like, here's cluster one, here's cluster two, here's cluster three. And it's only, a, it's basically CatGAN that's really good at saying, here's my first cluster and here's my second cluster because it can actually learn a neural network that can make a cluster that shape. I and mean, if those are your clusters, you literally could not make it in k-means. Because k-means is you know, roughly circular, no matter what you're trying to do. And most, most types of clusterings have that issue, but CatGAN gives you unsupervised clustering. Um, there's also an extension which allows you to do semi-supervised, a couple things like that. But overall, it's just showing how, how far the GANs can go, I guess. Right, so if you learn a kernel, you might be able to learn it. It depends, but as far as I've seen, the results on CatGAN are much better than what you would normally get. Because I think you compare with uh, CatGAN with plans. Yeah, yeah, I mean, these, these might be yeah, arbitrarily yeah. straw man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like I'm, I'm sure there are versions of, of k-means and stuff that will actually be able to get this, but it's a nice approach. It's, it's definitely not as flexible. Like. But yeah, I mean, if your kernel is arbitrarily complicated, then kind of. Um, but it, re it really depends. Um, yeah, I mean, we can circle back to that. But um, it, is, it is clustering. It is, it is a unique way to cluster. I will, I will leave it at that. Um, so this is a bit of a side note from GANs, but we'll talk about it a little bit just to understand the next model. And this is called DRAW. So DRAW is actually a VAE model. Um, and I know we're just going, going through papers, but so draw, what it tries to do is it tries to draw an image. So it's, it is an abbreviation, but the abbreviation is kind of cutesy and actually describes what it does. So what draw actually does is it goes through and recurrently, iteratively writes things to a canvas. So in terms of a block diagram, here's what it does. The left side is your regular VAE, which is you encode, you sample, you decode, versus your recurrent draw VAE is you encode, you sample, you decode, then you do it all over again. You do it through a loop, and as you do this, you actually get something that draws images. So here's a pretty cool um, 
pretty cool set of images. We've got another one on the next slide. But you see how instead of just outputting an image, it pretty much looks like it's you know, tracing a pencil over it, which I guess makes a lot of sense for MNIST especially. But it gives you a sense of trying to build a deeper understanding of what the images are. So obviously, you could generate MNIST images in one go. But the fact that you're iteratively making them and understanding the components that go together to make up the image, you hope to build a um, really just a deeper understanding of what you're doing. And a lot of what we talk about with generative networks are those broad kind of wishy-washy statements like deeper understanding and more complex and more rich. But that really is the best way to describe it, that this is a much more rich understanding of what, of how to draw a three and what a three means than just having a three. Um, here's another example of a drawing SVHN, which is street view house numbers. And you see that it actually starts drawing the numbers kind of like right to left. And it goes through and it first makes a background and then it draws some numbers onto the background. So this is a VAE, but it's, it's a sense of what generative networks can do. And going out there, there is, of course, a GAN equivalent. It's called GRAN but it's basically draw four GANs. Um, it has some, some nice sharp results. Um, I don't have them all in this paper, but you'll see a very similar kind of block diagram, which is roughly you have your samples, you decode them, and you do this iteratively. And samples are conditioned on what you had previously. So here's your uh, generative recurrent adversarial network. And in terms of what it actually does, that, that was what the overall is the overall architecture kind of the for loop part. And then here's each iteration of the for loop, roughly speaking. You can see that it has these convolutions and activation layers, yada, yada. Nothing too crazy about that. But the important thing is that you can do GANs in recurrent situations. You can do GANs in Laplacians. You can have models that are multiple GANs, multiple cat GANs. These things can all kind of be pieced and sliced together to make one full model, which is what you're actually looking to get. Um, so here's an example of how it draws. Um, they're not quite as clean as the MNIST images, but they're you know, buildings and other things. But you do get a sense of it kind of like gradually drawing and gradually sharpening up to make the image that it wants to make. Um, InfoGAN is one of the more interesting ones. Um, this one actually takes steps towards interpretability, which is a great word to use. Um, but it tries to disentangle hidden representations. Um, GANs learn a mapping from hidden state to your outputs, or from, from latent to your data, whatever you, whatever you want to call it, from your Z to your X. But it doesn't necessarily have to use everything from Z. It doesn't have to make a logical mapping from Z to X. It could make whatever mapping it wants. You hope it makes a nice, clean, smooth mapping, but that's not guaranteed to happen. What this does is it regularizes the GAN with an encoder function. It tries to learn this objective here, which is basically your regular GAN, but also the, um, the mutual information between your outputs and your source data should be maximized. So basically what that means is do your GAN but I want to be able to tell from my output image what my input was. So I want, I want the path backwards to be something that's available. And what happens when you do that is kind of fascinating. Your, your latent space becomes more interpretable. Because you're telling your network, I want to be able to get to the latent space from my images, then it's going to learn to make a connection between the two that has some sort of effect that you can actually you know, make a network and get. So this is an example of when you're changing, there, there is a specific uh, hidden state. And when you change the hidden state, it makes a different type of digit. Or when you change the hidden state, it gives you, so this is one hidden state going from left to right. On an InfoGAN, when you change the InfoGAN, you change this parameter, it's like, oh, this this vector of the hidden state means what digit it is. Here's another example below it, which is here's a vector. It means the slant. There's, there's a latent space. In the latent space, you actually know what it means. Because when you change it, you can look at it, and it's like, oh, it's slanting things. 
Um, there's another one which, this is the width parameter, so they learned a width representation. So what they're trying to show is that each of the elements of the latent space that they're learning, that they have the objective, are actually starting to become more meaningful. And then the upper right-hand corner example is on a regular GAN, like there's a latent dimension, but it's hard to tell what it's doing. It like, it adds a line next to the seven, then it takes it, like it's not interpretable. So using InfoGAN can actually regularize your GANs to be more interpretable, more understandable, and then that hidden state starts to mean more. Um, here's some probably even better examples of faces where they learn a dimension where if they change that dimension, you are looking up, or you are looking to the right, or you are lit better, things along those lines, wide faces, narrow faces. All of these dimensions start to become meaningful and something that you can actually use. Um, here's some chair results they also have. And you see that as they change a given value, the chair rotates, or the chair goes from like a kind of small stick chair to like a big thick armchair. And all of these things are very consistent and meaningful. And you see that, that the meaning is the same for different, different samples along the space, which would not be true in a traditional game. So this is the first step towards, it doesn't really learn an encoder, but it tries to make the hidden space mean a little bit more. Adversarial autoencoders are the next step coming after this. Uh, adversarial autoencoders are much closer to auto, well, they're really a combination of the two. Um, so it's based on an autoencoder. You learned an autoencoder. A variational autoencoder, you regularize the latent space using the KL loss. In an adversarial autoencoder, you regularize the hidden space using a GAN. So instead of the GAN discriminating between real and fake output data, it's discriminating between real and fake hidden dimensions, that you, or the latent space that you're giving it. Uh, what that actually looks like here is a bit of a drawing is this guy. So you see at the top, you've got a regular autoencoder. You've got your X, your X gives you a Z, and then your Z gives you back your regular X. But then there's this side branch here, which is drawing samples from P of Z, running and doing a discriminator on the Z portion, not doing a discriminator on the X. So this is the first step towards really training a full encoder and a decoder while using a GAN. Um, now what this actually gives you um, is an interesting comparison with VAEs. We've really got like five minutes left. Um, so compared to VAEs, you tell the VAE to learn a Gaussian, that's what it actually does on the right. Like you put your inputs in, the inputs will roughly look like a Gaussian, but it's not really making a Gaussian. You use the VA, you use the adversarial autoencoder, it will actually make the inputs look like a Gaussian. Uh, the example below it is you tell its inputs to look like a star, it will actually learn a star. Versus training a VAE to learn a star, it gets kind of close, but it doesn't actually, it doesn't actually match the prior that you gave it. Versus these adversarial autoencoders, the, the prior looks exactly like what it's supposed to look like. They're, the, the prior and the actual uh, generated samples are, are roughly the same. So it, it tends to fill out the space much better. That's another explanation for kind of why you see these blurrinesses is if you haven't filled up the space, your generator's never seen data from this space, it doesn't know what to do with it. Versus here, your space is entirely full, there's no place where you don't know what to do. It, it's better covered. Um, the other advantage here is with a VAE, you need to have a known prior that you can analytically calculate the KL difference. Versus here, all you have to do is you have to sample from your prior. Because if you can generate samples from your prior and you can generate samples from your network, you can train something to tell the difference between the two of them. So you can make your samples from your prior literally any function that you can generate from. So your prior could be a spiral. I don't know why you would want to make it a spiral, but you can make any prior completely arbitrary. It's at your mercy. Whatever you can generate, you can do. Um, we're going to skip over some of the semi-supervised and other things because I want to spend a few minutes on other things. Also, they do disentangle content and style. That's uh, a very hot topic too, the whole style discussion of understanding you know, what is the number portion versus what is the style of the number. Um, but then here's kind of the, the next step on after, after adversarial autoencoders. Adversarial autoencoders do train both an encoder and decoder, but they're not fully, they're not entirely GANs. They have these other things to them. 
versus bidirectional GANs are fully GAN. The only adversarial things are used to train both the encoder and the decoder. Um, and the way it works is the discriminator actually gets a pair. We see it looks like this. Um, we don't have a lot of time to spend on this guy, so I'm just going to put it up. But this is a very important paper to read in that you can train both directions. You train an encoder and a decoder, and you train them just to be um, reciprocals, basically. Um, but this gives kind of all the advantages of GANs and BAEs in that you have an encoder, you have a decoder, your, your, hidden st your, your latent dimension is exactly what your prior is, has a lot of advantages. Of course, it's harder to train, but we'll get to that next week. Here's the actual uh, function for it. And in terms of results, it means now you have an encoder. So their results really focus on the idea of now you can do queries, and now you can do other things that you couldn't do with just a purely generative network. Now you can go from x to y. You can go from y to x. So you've got everything you need to do any distribution you want. Um, and then we're going to leave off here. But so everything's solved. Everything's too big to be true. What's missing? Something's wrong here. And what it comes down to is optimization issues, that GANs do amazing things. We're talking about perceptual similarity. We're talking about all this like really cool high-level stuff. It's like, wow, this could do all this cool stuff. But actually getting them to work is tricky. And a lot of the things that we do to get them to work kind of cut down on how much they're actually doing. So there's this trade-off. So it's still an active area of research. Plenty to do, plenty to talk about on it. And next week, just as a preview, there are about four or five uh, slides of, of uh, references in here of things people have done to try to train them better, the issues people have, and kind of where it's gone to that. Um, so the two main directions on GAN research are ways to use them and ways to architect them, and then the other group of people who are just like, how do we get them to work and not you know, learn something crazy. Um, Check out the videos if you guys get a chance. There's a 40-minute video, but it's by Ian Goodfellow, who invented the whole thing. And it goes through everything. And so I could have just played that, and you guys probably would have learned funny. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. Any last-minute questions or concerns?